Uh, for those of you that maybe uh, got in just a little bit late, real quick announcement. If you don't mind doing me a favor and keeping your mask on, give her, Ige did uh, give like a new uh, order for the state, and we're just trying to honor that, um, especially just because we're indoors. So if you don't mind doing that, that would be uh, very, very helpful. Um, we're finishing up our series in First Peter today. It's the 10th week. It's been amazing, I, I think. I'm not commenting on my own preaching there, but <laughs> commenting on... In the book of the Bible that we've been able to study, and just what God, I think, is imparted on me, and I hope to us in the church family through it. And we get to finish up today looking at a great topic, and that's the topic of spiritual warfare. How many of you have ever felt like you've been involved in a battle that seemed beyond, you know, just the normal, just the usual, beyond what you see taking place in the natural, right? Have you ever had that sense of, like, there feels like there's forces working against me? Can I get all the married couples to give a big amen right now, okay? Right? It feels like there's outside forces and outside pressures that go beyond like my own stupidity, that go beyond my own sinfulness, that go beyond just the world like it is. There feels like there is evil present, right? And, and Peter's going to talk to us about how to stand firm and resist it and win. And I want to begin today actually not in 1 Peter. This isn't up on the screen, but the Lord gave me this verse in uh, worship, and I want to read this verse. This is from uh, where is it? Yeah, Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse uh, 19. Paul says, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. There's a word for somebody this morning. And then verse 20, And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. When we talk about spiritual warfare, that is God's will for your life. That's the end game right there. That God is going to do the crushing, but He's going to do it under your feet. So anytime we talk about spiritual warfare, we just have to understand we've already won because Jesus has already won. Amen? Right? And so we just get to be an instrument in God's hand of the final, you know, cleanup, so to speak, the final defeat of uh, the devil, of evil forces on this planet. Now I have to say this. Sometimes when we think about, oh, we're going to come against evil... We, we think of using the weapons of the world. We think of using physical violence. I don't know if anyone's been... <laughs> yeah, never mind. <laughs> There's some things that rise up in me where I just want to use physical violence to solve a physical problem. But that's not the weapons of our warfare. Uh, you know, we're tempted to use anger. We're tempted to use whatever means possible. But the means of our warfare can be very different. It's going to be destroying lies. It's going to be operating the opposite spirit. It's going to be coming against forces of hatred, deceit, with love, and with truth, right? And so Peter's going to be looking at this today, and we're going to join him. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. It says this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him! Standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So I'm going to say right from the beginning, one of the tactics that the enemy loves to use is self-pity. Right? I'm the only one that's experiencing this hardship, no one understands what I'm going through, they don't know what it's like to be me in my situation. And there? And Peter's just like saying, hey, just from the beginning, don't fall for that one. Understand that your brothers and sisters all over the world are experiencing the same thing that you are. Verse 10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now when we talk about uh, being on the alert, when we talk about spiritual warfare, you have to understand that, that the goal, the command is not to defeat the devil. Jesus already did that. Our command is to resist him, to stand firm in faith, right? Now, if we're going to do that, and here's kind of where I want to go this morning, it's kind of helpful to know some things. So we're going to look at three things that we just need to know generally about spiritual warfare. And then we're going to look at two specific things that Peter really, I think, instructs us in how to resist, how to stand firm in faith. Uh, three things we need to know, though. First one is this. We need to understand that the devil is a created being. Okay, some of us come from different backgrounds, we've watched too many movies, we have different perspectives on who the devil is and what he is. He was an angel, right? He was, he was a worship leader essentially in heaven because of his own pride and arrogance and wanting to be worshipped instead of being a worshipper. 
uh, rebelled against God, was cast out of heaven, right? But he's a created being, and it's really important, because some of us have this concept that he's like a co-equal with God. Like, there's this evil force in this world, and there's this good force in this world, and they're equal in strength, they're equal in might, and they're at war with each other. Satan is not a co-equal force with God by any stretch of the imagination. Right? Satan is not the opposite of God. Right? Hot and cold are opposites. Satan and God, they're not opposites. God is the one who has all authority. You know, some of us view like Satan and, and Jesus in like some, you know, some sort of tug of war. Right? We gotta remember Satan is not all powerful. Satan is not omniscient. Satan is not omnipresent. God is. You know, when Jesus was was uh uh, he had been crucified, he resurrected, and he was getting ready to ascend back to, to heaven, right? And he instructs his disciples in, in Matthew 28, 19, and right before that verse in 18, he's telling them, like, go disciple the nations. He said, here's the basis of you uh, of being missionaries to the world. Here's the basis of you discipling the nations. And he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. He says, I've got authority. If Jesus has all authority, how much is left for the devil? How much is left for the devil? It's actually the wrong answer. The right answer is however much we give him. Right? Because all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. He's delegated that authority to us. But through believing the devil's lies and deceptions, we kind of give some of that authority away to him. That's why he's fighting. He wants what you have in Christ. Right? But it's so, so important that we understand the devil's created being, he's not a co-equal, God is the ultimate power and authority of the universe. Amen? Amen. Here's the second thing we need to know. And this one's a given, but sometimes we forgive it. Number two is this. Uh, the devil is a liar. Now, we, I'll show you in a moment how we can really, really use this to our advantage. This is John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus is speaking about the devil. He says, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. Okay? What does that mean? Every time the enemy whispers something to you, every time he speaks, it's a lie. It's the opposite of what is true. Right? It's a deception. Now, this is what's so beautiful. Peter says, I want you to resist the devil. I want you to stand firm. One of the ways we can do this is by taking the opposite of whatever the devil speaks to be the truth. Okay? Uh, when our uh, daughter Sarah was married, she married a, a Brazilian uh, young man. And so uh, Lucas's parents flew over. They speak no English, and I know one Portuguese word. <laughs> Actually, I know two. I know obrigado, which means thank you, and no obrigado, which means no thank you. That's it. And I know shahasteria, which is like steak eatery. Three words, okay? That's all I know. So communicating was a little difficult. So it was right about that time that Google Translate came out, but there was like another app that would do it in real time. So every time Lucas's parents would speak, I'd hold a phone up to their face. And I have no idea what they're saying. All I hear is what's being translated through the phone. Every time we would speak to them, if Lucas wasn't around to translate for us, we would speak into a phone. They'd have no idea what we're saying. All they would know is what's coming through that phone. If you can picture the truth of God's word a little bit like that translation now. And every time the devil speaks, okay, it gets filtered through the word of God. It gets flipped around completely to the opposite, and now the truth comes out. Am I making sense? Yeah. Let me give you an example. The devil will come in, and he'll say, hey, you're never going to make it. Brings discouragement. That goes into my little Bible app. What comes out is, I'm destined to make it, and the devil's terrified of my destiny. Why? Because that's the word God says. The devil comes in and says, God would never forgive you of that sin. You can never go to church. You're never going to be as good as anybody else. That goes into my little Bible translation app, and what comes out is, God can't wait to forgive you. He loves you. This is, let me just read your verse, Luke chapter 15, verse 7, Amplified Version. Thus I tell you, Jesus is speaking, there will be more joy in heaven 
over one especially wicked person. How many especially wicked people do we have here today? Okay? Especially wicked person who repents, and over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. Is this making sense? And if you understand that the devil is a liar, you can actually kind of take some sick pleasure from the things that he says. Because you can know that if you can take it and turn it to the opposite, you've actually found the truth. Right? Now, how do I know if I've actually believed a lie? This is a great question. If the devil's a liar, how do I know when I've actually fallen into his trap and believed a lie? It's really simple. One of the easiest ways to determine that is when you lack hope in any certain area of your life. If you lack hope in an area of your life, meaning if you no longer have the expectation of something good coming from the Father in that area of your life, then you've believed a lie of the enemy. Let me read you another verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a cliche verse, everyone knows this. But it's the truth of God's word. God says, for I know the plans I have for you. And they have to understand, God has plans for your lives, so does the devil. You get to choose which one you're going to you know, walk in. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, the expectation of good, and not for disaster. To give you a future, and a what? Hope. So anytime I'm lacking hope in an area, I go, huh, there's got to be a lie. I can trace it back to a lie. When did that hope leave? Well, it's when this happened. Okay, what happened here? Okay, well, what lie did I begin to believe in that moment? And I can trace it back. And then I get out my little translation app and say, well, the devil's speaking discouragement. That must be something, mean something great is about to happen. Right? Because this is what the Word of God says. Amen? Here's the third thing that we need to know about the devil. And this is so great about this. God is using the enemy's worst to bring about his best in you. Okay, let me say that again. God is using the enemy's worst to bring about his best in you. This is 1 Peter 5.10. This is part of our passage today. After you have suffered for a little while, notice that sometimes God's going to allow the suffering to go on for a little bit. Right? Does it frustrate you that you can never figure out what a little bit actually means. <laughs> we don't know. God also went in charge of time. Time works differently with him. But here's what his promise is. After you have suffered for a little while, and the implication is from verse 8, at the hands of an attack, spiritual warfare, spiritual attack from the devil, right? After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to Jesus, to Him, be dominion forever and, and, and ever. Amen. And to understand, when the enemy comes into attack, his plan is to shake you to the point of breaking. Right? He wants to shake you to the point of failure. If you picture like hurricane, you know, coming, and, and you, you always have those picture, you know, those images of like trees and power lines that get shaken so much that they just fall to the ground, uprooted. That's the enemy's plan for your life. God's plan is actually for you to, in that time of shaking and spiritual warfare, to create these deep, deep roots into his word, into his love, into his character. Create these deep, deep roots into your identity in Christ so that you come to a place where it doesn't matter how strong the wind is that's blowing, you can bend with it and, sustain, and still survive, Right? And come right back, right? That's why you see like palm trees very rarely, you know, get destroyed in a hurricane. They got the ability to bend with it and poof, come right back. That's what God actually wants to bring about in your life. And so here's the beautiful thing: when the enemy comes and attacks, he thinks he's going to destroy you. But if we do what Peter tells us, and we'll look at this in just a moment on how to resist him and stand firm in faith, really what that's doing is strengthening us, perfecting us confirming our identity in Christ. It's like the Lord's using that pressure to create a stronger you in Jesus. He's using that pressure to, to create something new in you, some endurance, some strength, uh, a sharpening of your spiritual gifts, so on and so forth, that would never have come about unless that pressure was added. Anyone ever do CrossFit in here? Okay. Can you recall your very first CrossFit workout? go there. Some of you are getting a little PTSD. Okay? I remember my first 
And I'm in the middle of it, and I'm going, they are trying to kill me. <laughs> this is what's happening right now. They are out to destroy my well-being. Now, you get through that first workout, and especially the first couple workouts, <laughs> and you come to realize, no, they're actually establishing a deep strength and endurance in you. It's the same thing that God's doing. So when the enemy brings his worst, God's like, Deep roots. Now, it's not a guarantee. A lot of it's dependent upon how you stand, how you resist, how you interact with spiritual warfare that the enemy brings. But this is what God's plan is for our life. The enemy meant it to destroy us. God's like, nope, I'm going to use that to strengthen you and create an endurance that would not have been there if not for this spiritual warfare. All right? So three, three important things for us to know. How do we actually do it? How does Peter want us to resist and to stand firm? There's a lot, a lot that we can say about this. And I just really felt like we were to hone in on two things, and in reality it's really just one thing this morning. Okay? But let me give you these two things. The first thing is this. How do we actually stand firm and resist? Number one is this. Uh, I, I put it like this. You have to remember to remind. Okay? You have to remember to remind. What do I mean? It's important for us to understand when we come to spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare is primarily, like our act of responding to what the devil's bringing, is primarily reminding yourself of who God is and reminding yourself of who God says you are. Okay? That's primarily what it is. And then step two is choosing to believe it. When the enemy comes, you have to understand. Almost every act of spiritual warfare is aimed at two things. Your identity in Christ and your trust in God. That's it. There's little nuances and variations, but essentially the devil comes to try to uh, eat away at, to destroy your understanding of your identity in Christ and your trust in your Heavenly Father. But we see this from the very beginning. Remember the story of Adam and Eve, right? It's like the first spiritual warfare that took place on this planet. So they're in the garden, they're having a great time, and then this snake comes out, Satan comes about, tempts Eve, hey, did you see this fruit? It's gorgeous, it's low hanging. And he's like, no, no, we can't eat it. God said, don't. You know, don't do this. And you remember what Satan said? He said, did God really say that? He says, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. You see the identity? Now this is so interesting, okay? Because what did God already declared over them? Genesis 1.26 said, We created man in our image. God already said, You're like me, because you're created in my image. And the devil tries to break down, erode their trust. No, you can't trust what God said. He says you're like him, but you're not really like him. He says that he's giving you the plenty of this garden, but he's holding out on you. There's something better that you can get if you'll just trust me. So here's how these mind work. Okay, so you're saying if I uh, do this thing that goes against God's character and goes against what he told me to do, then I'll actually become more like him? That makes sense. And then took the fruit and ate it. <laughs> right? It was an attack on her identity. If you'll do this, you'll be like God. Wait, I thought I already was like God because I was created in His image. You can't trust God. You've got to trust Satan. You have to understand. Can we just boil it down for a second? Every time there's spiritual warfare, the devil's saying, hey, trust me instead of God. Can we just all admit how stupid we are when we fall for it? Now, here's the thing. He never says... If you trust me, you'll be more like me. Hey, you can be more satanic. woo -hoo. He says, if you trust me and do things my way, you'll be more like God. He says, no, no, I have a better path to holiness. I have a better path to power and authority. I have a better path to godliness in your life. Don't do it God's way. Do it my way. It's the same thing we saw happen in Matthew 4 when Jesus is tempted by the devil. Right? Matthew chapter 3, we see the baptism of Jesus, right? Talk about an epic baptism. Right? The clouds, you know, like the sky opens up and a voice from heaven, God the Father speaks. 
this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Identity. Okay? And it says immediately after he got up out of the water, the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 4, compelled Jesus into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Thanks, Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? Why? Because Jesus is our perfect mediator. He had to experience everything that we would experience. It says he was tempted as we are yet with, without sin. Right? So he's being tempted. What does the devil say? He says, Jesus. Ha, ha, ha. If you are the Son of God, do this. Do you see the identity? Okay? If now, God the Father just said, No, you are my beloved Son. This is who you are. And the devil says, Well, if, I mean, I, I, mean, if you, if, I mean, if you think you can trust God, great. But if you really are, do this. Now, notice the thing that you would tempt him on. He said, hey, turn bread, or turn stones into bread. Throw yourself from this temple. Worship me. What was that all about? It had everything to do with Jesus coming into the destiny that he knew that his father had promised him. And what was happening is the devil was essentially saying, hey, come up, you know, they're on the, the, the top of the temple. That means where everybody could see. There's a crowd below. And the devil's like, hey, throw yourself down. Everyone's going to see you free-falling. And then it says that the angels of God will catch you. What do you think that's going to do for your reputation? How do you think that's going to propel you into the kingship that I know you're here to gain, Jesus? You can't trust God. I've got a better way to accomplish what God's promised in your life. Jesus, I've got a less painful way of doing it. Right? He's trying to erode at Jesus' identity and his trust. And I love how Jesus you know, responded. He came back, and it's almost like you know he had the voice of the Father speak identity over him. He's like, "Go ahead, Satan, see if you can get through that. I know who I am. It is written: Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written: Do not put the Lord your God to the test." And he's like, "Father, I trust you. I trust your way. Even if your way seems more difficult and more painful, I still trust who you are. I still trust your way. So trust your promises. That spiritual warfare." Right? It's reminding ourselves of who God is, that He is trustworthy, He is our Father, and to remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. Truly, your identity in Christ is your greatest spiritual weapon. I'm bouncing around a little bit, but Paul in Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. Right? Like you can't ever hear a sermon on spiritual warfare and not talk about the armor of God. What I love about the armor is if you look at each individual piece you'll notice that each one really is an identity statement. He says, put on the helmet of salvation. This is the fact that I've been completely saved, completely forgiven. I've had my conscience renewed. James 1 says that, that I've been cleansed from all unrighteousness. This is the helmet of salvation. I once was a sinner, but now I am a saint, right? And he says, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, or another translation says, the body armor of God's righteousness. Doesn't that get you excited? I've always wanted body armor. Why can't we go back and wear body armor? <laughs> what is that? That's the full acceptance and approval of your Father. Christ's righteousness is God's approval of who you are now in Christ. And it doesn't mean that he approves of everything that you do. He'll bring correction, Absolutely. But when he looks at you, I mean, every single morning we need to wake up and put on the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. It's saying, Father, I am fully accepted by you today. I am fully approved of you today because of what Christ has done for me on the cross. And it's like, it's like we're saying, try to get through that devil. Right? The belt of truth. Who I am in Christ, what God has said about me, what God has said about Himself, that will combat the lies of the enemy, the shield of faith, the gospel, you know, the readiness of peace, the peace that the gospel brings. All these different things, they're all weapons that really have to do with your identity in Christ. Now, here's the thing, when we talk about you know, our identity and remind ourselves of who we are, there's almost like this continuum, and this is really important, okay? On one side of the spectrum, you've got uh, condemnation. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got pride, arrogance, legalism, religiosity. And right in the middle, you've got gospel truth of who Christ says you are and what Christ has done for you. 
What the enemy wants to do is to bring you to either one of those extremes. He doesn't care if you're condemned. He doesn't care if you're prideful and arrogant and think you're all that. As long as you don't go to that middle place of the truth of the gospel. Is this making sense? Right? Because the gospel says that you're scum. And the gospel says that I'm scum. That we've sinned, we've fallen short of God's glory. But that Christ loves us so much that he died, he was tortured, you know, on the cross. So that we can be fully forgiven, fully renewed, born again, fully accepted by our Father. And so the gospel is this ground where we recognize our lack and we recognize the greatness of God's grace and mercy in our life. Condemnation tries to say you're just scum. Religious, you know, religiosity is just trying to say I'm all that. Am I making sense? So when we remind ourselves of who we are, it's that, that center, safe place of, yes, this is who I was, a sinner. But I am a sinner saved by grace. Amen? Okay. Here's the second thing. This is what's really fun. Okay, first thing, we've got to remind ourselves. We've got to remember to remind. Second thing of how we stand and resist the enemy is this. Use the devil's own momentum against him. Kind of hinted at this, but I want to explore a little more. Use the devil's own momentum against him. 1 Peter 5, 9, Amplified Version. Withstand him. Be firm in faith against his onset. Onset. Rooted. Established. Strong. Immovable and determined. Do you, do you get the visual picture of that? The enemy comes and runs at you, and you're just standing in place. You do not move a bit. Right? Let me give an illustration of this to you. Uh, my kids are doing jujitsu for the first time, loving it. So we're at the park uh, last, you know, early evening, all playing and resting around on the grass. And one of my children, uh, who will go unnamed, except it starts with an H and ends with an alien, um, <laughs> was wrestling with me. We're having fun, and I um, can only imagine what the cars are thinking driving by as we're like, you know. But we're wrestling, and, and she's getting into it. We're having fun, and she's getting a little bit more aggressive. And so she runs at me and tries to, like, flying crane, you know, knee and kick me type of thing. A little different than jujitsu. And so I'll have this dad moment of, oh, I need to put her in her place. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm standing firm, and all I did was stick my arm out, let her hit my arm, and then I just gently caressed her back, and I knelt down, and in a split second, she is thud on the ground on her back, looking up absolutely shocked. I haven't moved an inch. I am standing firm in place. Because true jujitsu, if you know it, judo, any of those things, has... Everything to do with using the least amount of effort and using your enemy's effort, their momentum, to accomplish what you want to do with them. That's exactly what I did to her. Now, she was fine. Slight concussion. She's totally fine. Okay? <laughs> she came running. A slight movement and wham! She did all the work. In the same way when we're in spiritual warfare, we can allow the enemy to do all the work. To bring about good in our life. To pro propel us forward in Christ. Right? Let me give you another example. Uh, in Judges chapter 14, uh, verse 5 and 6, it's the story of Samson. And Samson's one of those tricky ones to preach about because he really wasn't a good dude, but God used him. But there's this picture, there's this, this incident that happens. And I just want to kind of share the story and then we'll look at it a little bit. But in Judges chapter 14, verse 5, it says, As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. Remember, Peter says that our enemy is like a roaring lion seeking so something to, to devour. So it says, As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. I don't know how easily it is to tear apart a young goat. But he did it as easily as if it were a young goat. But he didn't tell his father or mother about it. Now, I know it's a little gory. It's in the Bible. It's legal. If you want to be biblical, just start ripping lines apart. Right? But I want you to see the picture of him standing firm. 
of being immovable, of really using the strength of the enemy that was coming against him, coupled with the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit, that he came just, right? It's such a picture of what God wants to do in your life. When we stand firm and resist the devil, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to pour out His love and the love of the Father into our hearts. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to impart identity. Like any, I don't know if you've had this experience before where you, you've given your life to Jesus, you love God, but then you have these horrific thoughts come into your mind. Right? Like the type of thoughts where you're like, gosh, if anybody knew I had that thought, how could I be a Christian and possibly have that thought go through my mind? Right? You have to understand that the enemy has access to your mind. That he can actually whisper things. That's why Jesus said he's a liar, don't listen to him. And what happens to some of us is we have those horrific thoughts go through our minds. I mean, some of you literally have had thoughts. I've heard your stories, thoughts of like, you know, like horrific blasphemies against God. You're like, I love God. And yet there's like these curse words against God that you have these thoughts in your mind. And you're going, where is that coming from? How is this happening? Right? I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but guarantee if I ask right now, there would be several of you that, yeah, I've had that experience of like curse words and just horrific things against God going through my mind, even though my heart, I know that I love God. I know that I love Jesus, right? And so the question is, where is that coming from? And the devil wants to come with us, just you. This is who you are. You're trying to love God, but this is who you really are. And we think this is coming from inside of us. But what we have to realize is this is actually a lying coming from the outside. This is the enemy lying to us, right? And so what we can do by using the devil's own momentum, that thought can come in, and it can be like a reminder on your watch, a reminder on your phone that actually drives you in the complete opposite direction. When, the Holy Spirit, you know, when, when a horrific thought comes into my mind, I bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, this isn't me. And I begin to think, wow, Lord, that used to be me. Thank you so much for the transformation that you've brought in my life. Holy Spirit, I love you so much. I am so amazed at the work that you've done in my life. I love your presence. I love it when you speak truth to me. I love the way it feels to be in your presence and to hear your voice. And the enemy's going, wait, 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 this thought. And I'm like, yeah, that used to be a thought I would have entertained. Not anymore, because now I am so radically in love with Jesus, and I'm so amazed, Jesus, with what you've done in my life. And the devil's still trying to get attention. He's throwing these thoughts, you know? Uh, Paul called fiery, fiery darts of the enemy, right? And we use those darts, and it hits, and we just go, wow, Jesus. Do we even need to give attention to the enemy? No. Which is really funny, because it drives him nuts. He's the epitome of pride and arrogance. He wants attention. And so he comes running... And we just allow that momentum to work against him and to propel us straight into the arms of the Holy Spirit. To propel our hearts straight into worship. To propel our hearts straight into a place of just thanking Jesus for the transformational work that he's done in our lives. David put it like this in Psalm 23. He says, You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. How cool is that? The enemies coming with those thoughts the circumstances, that discouragement, whatever it might be. And the Lord's like, hey, I just prepared a feast of my presence right in front of you. Why don't you ignore this and why don't you start eating? Why don't you make the devil watch as you enjoy it? Because you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. God wants to use the attack of the enemy to be a moment of honoring you and blessing you in His presence. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. Sometimes we feel pursued by the devil. God's like, no, no, no. It's my goodness and my love that's pursuing you. Don't worry about him. Make him watch as you enjoy my goodness, my presence, my unfailing love. Surely your goodness and family love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. It's the presence of the Lord, and as we enjoy the presence of the Lord, that drives the devil nuts more than anything. 
You want you you got those thoughts coming in your mind. You got those temptations. You want them to stop them, and the best way to do it, worship Jesus every time they come. Because yeah. eventually the devil's gonna go, I gotta get him to stop worshiping. I'm not tempting him like that anymore. I'm not gonna put that thought in her mind anymore. That's just driving her to Jesus. Drive her straight into the arms of the Holy Spirit. And you understand, this really, the Holy Spirit is the key. It's His presence that is the key to overcoming temptation, to, to winning these spiritual battles. But look at this, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Okay? It's Luke's story, his uh, telling of the Matthew 4 account of Jesus being led into the wilderness to be tempted. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. What was the key to Jesus' success? Feasting on the presence of God. He was full of the Holy Spirit. The devil came and he was just like, whew, straight to worship. Straight to communion and intimacy with his Heavenly Father. Amen? So, when we're standing firm and resisting, what does that look like? It honestly looks like a lot of things, and we can get more nuanced and more specific. But here's the overall picture. you got to remember to remind yourself who you are in Christ. Who God is. Don't let Him touch your trust in God. Don't let Him touch your identity. Get back to the Word. And then, jujitsu the devil. <laughs> Use this momentum to drive you straight in the arms of the Holy Spirit. And then watch what happens. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We love what you're doing in our lives. And Lord, we know that our enemy is real. We know that he's out to get us. We know that deception is his tool, that lies his language. But Lord, we don't have to be afraid of it. You are our greatest good. You're the one who defeated Satan. And you're defeating him under our feet. We can stand firm as we just simply enjoy your presence. Yes, we're going to be aware of the enemy's tactics. We're not going to fall for them. We're going to set our mind on what is pure and noble and true and good and a good reputation and all those things. But ultimately, we're just going to feast on your presence. So, Father, I just pray right now for us as a church family that this week, Guys, you have to understand, I preach on spiritual warfare, which means it's going to happen this week. Always works like that. So, Holy Spirit, I just pray that this would be a week of just enjoying your presence a whole lot. Of being aware of your presence a lot more than we have in the past. Of being more purposeful. Of being more disciplined, as Peter would say. Sober-minded, being more disciplined to worship you. To engage in specific times of just stopping what we're doing in worshiping. That we would be more disciplined for the purpose of prayer, as Peter would say, this week. And not just prayer as like a duty, but prayer as like a joy. <laughs> prayer of, of, of almost just, you know, it says be sober-minded. Prayer in, in a sense of just enjoying, almost in like a drunken state, Lord. Because you say that's what the Holy Spirit does. It influences us. It brings control into our lives. That we would just enjoy you. We would drink you in this week. And then it would drive us right through the plans and the purposes of the end. We just pray it down in Jesus' name. Uh, I just had a keen sense from the Lord um, that worship and prayer would be very, very important this week. But specifically, it's not just me for you, but it's me for the people around you. I saw a picture of the enemy attacking others, like members of your family, people in the community, people in your circles, right? And it was like absolutely necessary for you to have been in the presence of the Lord. Like I actually saw pictures of, of us as a you know, church family, individuals, like radiating just the glory of the presence of God. Smile on our faces because we've been in His presence. And then that, coming into contact with other people who are being oppressed by the devil is what's going to break it. So we say yes to you, Jesus. We say yes to your call in our life this week. And we pray now. Amen.